I'd ask you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25, it reads, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers who stripped him, beat him, departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay and when I, when you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. I want to speak to you today a message entitled, Love Thy Neighbor. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we live in interesting times. Very interesting times. Polarized times. Chaotic times. Opinionated times. And so, Lord, I pray for us today that we would understand this great text as it speaks to us not only about earthly things, but eternal things. And I pray for us that we would be a people who recognize your word and we would not only read it today, we would believe it today and we would live it today. I pray this is our heart. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's been such a joy to come multiple times now to preach, of course, here at Ridgeway Baptist, and it's been amazing to to come on Wednesday nights. And by the way, uh, if you don't have anything going on on Wednesday nights, which you probably don't, I'm just kidding, but but if you don't have anything going on and and you need to, which you do, is you should be here on Wednesday nights to be a part of what's going on here. God is doing great things in the youth ministry here with children here and also with adults, and we'd love to have you. So please, please come if you can on Wednesdays. Y'all have been so loving and welcoming to us as a as a, as a family. I'm so grateful to have my wife Emily here. I'm so grateful to have little Wesley again. And then we have a, uh, a child who is, um, is, is a foster care child to us. And, and JJ is his name. And so it's a blessing to be able to care for him, to love him, and, uh, and take care of him. And so, um, and so we're blessed to do that. But I want to thank you all so much for being our neighbor. I want to say thank you so much for loving us. I want to thank you so much for caring for us. And when we look at a text like this, I can't help but think of that's the big push. It's the acts of kindness, the acts of generosity, the acts of charity, the acts of love. And that's what you see in this passage. Do you know that this is a worldwide accepted story? 
It's not just for Christians necessarily. It's for all peoples. It's in countries. It's used by sociologists. It's used by psychologists. It's used by lawyers. In all the 50 states of America, there is called a Good Samaritan Law. Isn't that amazing? Right out of the pages of the Word of God, there, is, there are laws. And there's actually two different types of laws that are called the Good Samaritan Laws, depending on what state you're in. But, but there's one type of, of, of Good Samaritan Law that says that if someone has uh, if helped somebody else, let's say they were choking, or you saw them in need, or there was some issue going on, maybe it was a wellness check, and you called 911, and you had 911 come to their house, whatever it is, maybe for a wellness check, they cannot sue you for that. Or if you see someone choking in a restaurant and you run over there and you do the Heimlich maneuver and they cough up whatever piece of steak was stuck in their throat and then all of a sudden everybody celebrates but then they realize, oh, you broke a couple of ribs. You can be protected because you saved their life even though there was maybe some injury there. But that could be the Good Samaritan law at work in a person's life who's trying to do the right thing. But there's another form of Good Samaritan law that actually says that if you don't do something when there is then there's a person in danger or in need and you and you pull away and say I don't want to get involved you can be prosecuted for not getting involved or not calling 911 and you're to do that it's funny that there's some shows out there that have put this as a part of their shows you must care for those not just put up your phone and say, hey, I got it on film. Not just to become the next viral video. It's not just to become the next celebrity. Look what I got. But you're to help them. It's amazing how the Good Samaritan has made an impact on the world in so many different ways. And so I want us to look at this wonderful story. Now, some people would call this a parable. Some people would say, no, this is probably a real event of a person, which by the way, most parables, it seems to be like real events that took place at a time, you know, even though they, they might be a, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, they, they seem to have a, a lot of credence or, or a lot of credibility in things that actually happen in this life. But what I want you to see here is that loving thy neighbor is is just as important as loving the person next to you, loving someone that you wouldn't normally love, loving someone that's not even lovable. It's not only that, but there's an earthly aspect to it, but there is a heavenly aspect to it. And I think you see that in this story. I want you to first see, number one, the, the true power of God's word. So let's look at the beginning of this. It says in verse 25, it says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. So a lawyer is someone in that time who knew the, the Torah, that knew the word of God, especially the first five books of the Bible. It was somebody like that. So they, they knew the word of God extremely well. And these lawyers back in the day, they tried to question a lot of things. They were always questioning people. And here's Jesus doing miracles. Here's Jesus Jesus saying he's the son of God. Here's Jesus saying, I am God. Have you seen the Father in heaven? Uh, I am him or whatever it might be. Uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father in heaven. It's that perspective, right? And so they're coming at Jesus and asking him questions. Oh, you're saying all these things. Let me find out more about you. And so they're asking questions. So here's this lawyer. He stands up in the midst of a crowd. You know, there's always crowds around Jesus. And he stands up and he says, teacher, rabbi, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He just went eternal in his question. Did you see that? What must I do to receive eternal life? Well, the question is interesting. Number one, it's important because we're talking about eternal things. But number two, it's a little flawed in its understanding of what it means. Because what he says is, what must I do? What must I make happen? What action must take place for me to receive eternal things? And friends, we know this. You can't receive anything spiritual in this life or anything eternal by works of the flesh. It can't happen that way. Not by your works of the flesh. Jesus' works can bring out all kinds of things because he is perfect, righteous, holy. His work on the cross was a spiritual, righteous, perfect, eternal act that brought forth a saving of our mortal bodies. That's what Jesus Christ brought about. So what do you see in this passage? You see, it's, it's, it's a good question, 
but it's a little flawed in what shall I do because there's nothing we can do to attain eternal life. He goes on to say, and, and Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read? So that's a great question. He turns the question on its end and he says, okay, so you're asking me, maybe trying to trouble me or maybe question me or maybe trying to figure out what's going on. He says, so I'm going to ask you a question. Let's get into your life a little bit. What do you know, lawyer? What do you really know? That's what Jesus says. And Jesus says to him, what is it in the law? What is it read? What, what can be said there? What do you find there? And he answered correctly. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor. You should love him. Love him as yourself. And Jesus says, you are right. You answered correctly. Do this, do these things, and you will live. So here we have the power of the word of God at work, the true power of God's word at work. But listen how the question goes. When he asked him, what did the lawyer say? The lawyer said this. He said, you shall, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, all the same thing, love your neighbor as yourself, and that's how you will be saved. But interestingly enough, when you look at what the man understood, it's different than what he's just saying. Have y'all ever found yourself that way? You said something correctly, but you believe differently. You thought about something. We ought to love everybody, but the way that you live your life is not loving everybody. Actually, you got several people in your, in your heart and mind that you hate. I believe that pastor up there, he's saying love thy neighbor, but in my heart, I could never love so and so. I can never do that. Last week we started talking about what is love, and love is laying down one person's life for another. Jesus Christ laying his down life for the, for the people who are broken in a crooked generation, and people who were all kinds of messed up, and Jesus died on the cross for them. He died on the cross for you. He laid down his life so that you could be saved. The beautiful picture of love there, and he's saying this is how a person gets saved, loving God, Loving people, it's one thing. Did you know the whole Bible is wrapped up in two commands? Love God, love people. If you take all the Ten Commandments, you take the Torah, you take everything in the Old Testament and you put them all together, you know what you have? You have love God, love people. That's it. That's what it is. That's what it's all about. So when he asks him, what must I do to have eternal life? He's asking a really good question. It kind of reminds me, I don't know if y'all remember, but Kay Locklear preached here a few weeks ago. I wasn't here for that sermon. I totally missed that sermon, but I've heard that sermon. And it's a great one. He preached that at Mid-America, Acts chapter 16. And you know in Acts chapter 16, it's about the Philippian jailer. Do y'all remember the sermon? It was really good, right? I, I think he did a good job here. I'm not sure. But, but... It was really good when we heard it. And so um, he preached a sermon about a Philippian jailer who asked the greatest, what I believe is the greatest question of all time, and he received the greatest answer of all time. Do y'all remember what the greatest question of all time is? What must I do to be saved? I don't know of a better question. Do y'all know a better question? I don't know of another question that's better than that one. What must I do to be saved? And then he received the greatest answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That kind of rings similar to what's going on in this passage. But here's a lawyer with certain intentions, not fully understanding the love of God. And so what does Jesus do in all his incredible wisdom? And all his knowledge of this man's heart, he knows his heart. Do you know what he does? He says, I'm going to explain it to you in a story. A lot of times when I'm explaining things to my son, little Wesley, I use a story. And I'll tell a story to say, hey, it's kind of like this. It's like this. That's what Jesus did. And he did that to this man because this man heard things read to him and he read them for himself, but he didn't fully grasp it. It wasn't something that he just said, I get it. I know what it's all about and I'm going to take it and apply it. He was knowledgeable of it, but he didn't act upon it. There's another guy in the Bible that y'all know well, known as the wisest man ever, King Solomon. He had 
all the wisdom you could ever imagine. It was given to him by God. It was a gift from heaven. Just, you just imagine God just decided to send down wisdom from above, and here it comes, there it comes, wisdom's coming, wisdom's coming, boom, and all of a sudden I have it, and Solomon can make all of the right decisions as he judges people, as he leads people, as he administrates, as he does all of that stuff, he has all the wisdom that God would ever give to him. Here he is with this great wisdom. You know what his problem was, though? He didn't apply what he knew, and because he didn't apply what he knew, it actually hurt him. It caused more pain in his life, more struggle in his life. I think this lawyer is probably similar to that. He has a lot of knowledge and wisdom, but it's not become a part of him. He has not believed it. He has not lived it out. It's not become a part of him. And so here he is asking the question, and then Jesus decides to not only show him the power, the true power of God's word, but secondly, Jesus shows him the true value of human life. If you look around right now, I'm looking at all of y'all, people watching online. I'm looking at y'all, and you know what I see? I see souls, souls, people made in the image of God, fearfully and wonderfully made. It's incredible to think of that. And there's a lot of people today who are lessening the value of human life on every level. Whether it's euthanasia, whether it's euthanizing people that are senior adults, eh, got nothing, they got nothing for us anymore, cost more money to keep them alive. There's that kind of talk going on, even in D.C. There's talk like that going on, but the talk that's already been in place for a long time is go ahead and take out the infants in the womb because they are of no value to me and it's inconvenient so therefore we will snuff them out as well and we just kind of exterminate and eliminate whoever we want by putting a value on human life and that's what the world has become it's become a place that values who they want to value someone that uh, cares about their beliefs cares about their ideals cares about what they think and then that's that's those are the only people who are valued but it's interesting in this passage look at what it says if you go back to verse you go back to verse 29 it says but he desired to justify himself said to jesus and who is my neighbor jesus replied to him a man was going down from jerusalem to jericho simply a man We don't know his background. We don't know his record. We don't know uh, his upbringing. We don't know anything about this guy. We don't know the color of skin. We know nothing about him. All we see is there's a human who's on a journey. He's just a man, any kind of man. And he says, here's this guy going down this road. And as he's going down this road, robbers, because robbers, you know what robbers do? They rob. You know what thieves do? They steal. Do you know what criminals do? Crime. You know what sinners do? You know what people who are lost and going to hell do? Nice sin. You know what homosexuals do? Homosexual things. That's what what they're doing. Because that's who they are. Someone who's a drunkard, they drink. That's the mindset. That's what the robbers are doing what they're doing because they're ungodly and they're vile in every way. And doing. But here's a man walking down the road, going down the road, whatever it is, and here he is, just no background to him, and here is a soul of God. And here's the point. God, Jesus, is wanting this lawyer to know that this is not just some loser It's not just a person who no one cares about. It's just a man who is in need of assistance. And so what we have in the story is that this man gets beaten, he gets robbed, and and, and so what do you have? Well, first off, you have the priest who comes by, and the priest who does all his priestly duties in the temple, he walks by and he says, oh, I can't get near him. If I get near him, I'll be ceremonial and clean. And if I'm ceremonial and clean, then I can't do my job. And God said to be clean. God said to be clean. Hey, friends, didn't God say to be clean? 
Didn't God say it? God said it. In Leviticus 21, he said, priests and Levites, be clean. Be holy. You can't really call him out on a crime. He was doing what God told him to do. What did he do wrong? God told him back in Leviticus, make sure you stay holy. Don't go touch a dead person. Don't get, get, go to an unclean person. Don't get that filth on you. Instead, stay away. And you know what he did? Whether it was by his own personal things, whether it's by his understanding of God's word, whatever it might be, he decided he's going to hold on to piety and reject charity. That's what he decided to do. Okay? An interesting thought. The priest did that. Who else did that? The Levite did that. Two people went by on the other side to get away from him so they didn't have to help him. Now, whether that was from a a, a pious heart of saying, I can't get unclean. I just need to stay. I do what God's called me to do. But you know that when someone is in need, when someone is hurting, what did Jesus do? Who's a better priest than Jesus? Nobody. What did Jesus do when the man with the withered hand walks into the Sabbath, on the Sabbath day, and comes in? What did Jesus do? He healed the man, and they all got onto him. What are you doing? You can't do work on this day. He said, if one of your sheep falls into a pit, do you not go help it, even on the Sabbath? You see, there's rules that God has put in place, but when it comes to charity in the moment, we're to do it. We're to help somebody. We're to pour into them. And you know what they did? They walked by on the other side of the road saying, I'm not going to help this man. It doesn't matter if he's dead already or he's half dead. I'm not going to do it. What an interesting thought to not drop what you're doing to go and help somebody. Now, there's a third man that comes walking past. And he's a Samaritan. Now, this, th- there's a feud with the Samaritans that goes back to 723 B.C. There's a feud. And what happened is the Assyrians come in, and they besiege, and they capture Jerusalem, and then they take a bunch of uh, Israelites or Jewish folks back to Assyria, and then they send a bunch of Syrians in, and what they did was they intermarried with them. And so in that, they not only intermarried, but they created some places of worship in Mount Gerizim. They, they created a new culture, and in this new culture, and in this new mindset, and this new religion that they started in Samaria, with the Samaritans, it became a, a, a very big issue for the Jews. And they're like, you have branched away. You are not really Jewish, if anything. You are a half-breed of Jews. And so Samaritans became a derogatory term of who those people are. And so the Jews didn't associate with them. They would actually not even walk onto their land. They would walk miles around just to not put feet on their dirt. This is where you get statements like, man, we left that place, I wiped my feet off. Get the dirt off you. My, my dad used to, he's so funny, he worked at the airport. He's probably watching right now. This is, this is actually fun. So he, um, uh, it was so funny because he would get home from the airport and he worked at the airport and worked on the ramp doing different things like that. And it was so great. I mean, like, we, we would hear all these stories, got to fly around and do all kinds of wonderful things because my dad worked for the airlines. It was great. I mean, pass riding used to be a lot of fun, y'all. It used to be non-rev riding. That was fun. I don't know what it is now. It's just not as, not as glorious. But anyways, it used to be a lot of fun. And so I enjoyed that with my dad and got to do several of those kinds of things. It was so good. But he would say a phrase that just made me laugh. And now my brother and I say it. Um, he used to say this phrase, I got to wash the airport off me when I get home because there's all kinds of issues at the airport. I got to wash it off. If we go into Memphis pretty deep into Memphis, we'll come home and say, man, we got to wash Memphis off of us. You know what I mean? Like you say that phrase. Some of you get home from a family reunion and say, I got to wash the family off me a little bit. You know, you say these phrases because you're like, man, it is just hard. It's hard, hard living. Well, I want to tell you that mentality comes directly from what we see with the Jews and the Samaritans. Man, if you get near them, you got to wash it off. You don't want any of that on you. And so there was this big prejudice issue between Samaritans and Jews, and they couldn't come together. And so here's this guy that's called the Samaritan, right? It says there, right, in, 
it says there, right, um, it says, but a Samaritan, right, verse, what was that, 33? But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion, meaning love inside, meaning something in his, in his, in his stomach turned over, how can I help? And he, and he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He cared for him. He gave things that would help his wounds. He, he, he made him feel better. He, 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 he put bandages on him. And then he gave him, put him on his own animal, and he brought him to an inn to take care of him. That's incredible. This guy went way out of his way to do all these things. And so I want to give you a couple of thoughts just about the Samaritan that I think are helpful. Number one, the Samaritan was aware of his surroundings. I think sometimes we walk with blinders on our eyes and we, we walk around so that we don't see the problems in the world. And, 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 and if we don't see the problems in the world, then I don't have to do anything about them. I'll be honest with you. I've, I'm guilty of this a lot of times. I'm guilty of this. I'll go into Lowe's or we'll go into a store or something like that. And man, I don't necessarily want to see any issues going on. I just want to kind of keep my head down and find my thing and get out. That's kind of how I think a lot of times. I don't want to get involved in drama. I don't want to get involved in issues. I don't want to do that. But listen, if something comes by your pathway, you need to have your eyes open. And you need to be looking, what is it? Here is a Samaritan aware of his surroundings, aware of what's going on, how people are being hurt, how people are, are going through a difficult time. And this is interesting because what he does is, with his eyes open, he sees someone in need. And you know what he does? He is so aware of his surroundings that he, 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 he's, he's, he's trying to find ways, possibly, where he can help out. I love what Henry Blackaby, with the book Experiencing God, said years ago. He said this. He said, look around you and see where God is working and get involved. And I think a lot of times that's in needs. What are going, what's going on around you where there's a need? How can I get involved? Number two, not only does a Samaritan aware of his surroundings, was he aware of his surroundings? What else he did was he took the initiative. This is something that we find ourselves uh, kind of saying, somebody else will do it. Or we say it in another way, we'll pray for you. That is one of the inter most interesting ways to avoid helping someone. In the Christian world, we say a phrase a lot of times that we may not be as genuine about. We'll say, I'll pray for you. And it sounds good, but if there is any way inside you to maybe help that person in that situation, maybe you should answer your own prayer and go ahead and help them. That's kind of funny to think of that, right? Maybe we should go ahead and answer our own prayer. We could actually say, I'm going to pray for you, but guess what? I'm going to go ahead and try to help you out as well. Help while you can. Now, I know some situations are out of your hands, and you can't do anything in that situation. I get it. We have lived a lot of that in the last few months. We can't do, people can't help us in some situations that we deal with. I get it. But man, Praying is the first thing that we can do for people. Number two, how can we help them? Maybe there's a way. But I would just want to say this. Um, if we don't take the initiative, then who will? Several years ago, I was uh, part of a youth group in South, in South Tampa. And wow, we had, we had a set of leaders in that youth group. They were top-notch. They've all gone, I think they've all gone into some form of ministry, and some of them have gone on to seminary and gotten doctorates, and they're teaching. They're doing this there, this there, here and there. you got some people running major Christian organizations. God really gave us a great youth group. I came up in a strong youth ministry. I don't know how God blessed us like that, but it was wonderful. There was one, uh, one summer where the youth pastor said, I want everybody in this youth group to create a devotion a and a testimony, and I want you to share it with, with everybody else. And I'll never forget this one. It was actually given by one of my good friends. Her name's Nikki, well, Nikki Finch at that time. And, uh, and so she, she said, she said this in her devotion. She shared her testimony, and then she said this in her devotion. She said, I think we all need to consider something very, very seriously, that we would never live life with regret. She titled her little devotion, she called it this, she says, living life without regret. 
I don't know how many times God has put something in your pathway and you neglected it or you avoided it or said, I don't know about this. When God gave you an opportunity, it's right there. Just like the Samaritan, the dude is right there. He's half dead. Two people have already walked past him. Here he is, and here you come walking by and like, yeah, he looks pretty bad. Yeah, man, wonder how much stuff the robbers got, got, got away with. No, here's a dude that's down and out. What can you do? He's right there in your path. How can you help? Live life without regret. And then I want you to see thirdly what the Samaritan gave. He gave his time, his comfort, and his money. In other words, the Samaritan put his money where his mouth was. What did he do? He gave the oil and wine to to help the person's bandages, uh, to help the person heal up. He gave money. He took time out of his day to make sure he got where he needed to go. And he was willing to give more. He's willing to give more. You know, if you think about our greatest possessions are of no value unless we're willing to give them all away for the cause of Christ. Do you know who said that? The founder of Chick-fil-A. Let me say it again. Our greatest possessions are of no value unless we are willing to give them all away for the cause of Christ. You been to Chick-fil-A lately? That's who said it. He says, you know you're wealthy when you're willing to give it all away for the right thing. That's so good. But let me just say something that's kind of hard on us. And it might be difficult, even though it might cost you money, even though it might cost you time, who's watching? Jesus is watching us. So we need to be able to have our eyes open for whatever it is in front of us so that we can help out in a time of need. That's number one. Number two, we also need to be good stewards of what we have so that we can give. If we're not good stewards of what we have, you'll never, we'll never be able to help anybody. Do you know who's not helping people right now? The homeless. You know who's not helping people? The people who are, who are on generational wealth, welfare. You know the people that are not helping people? The people that are standing in line taking, take, they're they're receiving handouts. They're not helping people. Can we just be honest? They're not helping. Do you know why? Because they can't. And it could come from all kinds of reasons. Maybe they were a, 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 a veteran and they went through some major issues. Maybe it was this, maybe it was that, whatever it can be. But however you lay it down, they can't really help because they haven't been good stewards of what they've been given or maybe there's an issue in their life. But I will tell you this, I have have several people, whether they're in my family, whether they're outside my family, whether they're in churches, and they can't help a soul in need. Do you know why? Because they got nothing to give. They don't have any time. They don't have any money. They don't have any energy. They got nothing. Because they haven't been good stewards of what they have, so they can't give out of the abundance. Do you know how many times I've been in a hospital room How many times I've been in a hospital room and watched someone, a dad or a mom, who has let maybe their body go, they have done all kinds of things to ravage their body, all kind of unhealthy things, whether it's drinking, whether it's drugs, whether it's cigarettes, whether it's just Doritos for every meal, whatever it might be, we do things to our bodies that are so bad sometimes that we cause havoc on the family, and we can't do anything for the family because we put bad things in our, in our system, so therefore it causes all kinds of issues for our family that's serious think of a drunkard he takes milk out of the baby's mouth so that he can put beer in his think about this this Samaritan if he was like that caught up in the world system hooked on some drug caught up in whatever it is doesn't have any money to his name doesn't have any uh, he's not a steward of anything and here he is being called to do something with something right in front of him and he can't because he doesn't have anything to do he doesn't have any way of doing it any means of doing it oh friends don't be like that be a person who is a hard worker be a person who gives all glory to Christ. Be a person who's a good steward of what they've been given. Be a person who goes all in and be a person with their eyes wide open so that they can help the people in need. 
But can we get back to the true meaning of the text for a minute? Because this text is about an eternal question. (laughs) Isn't that funny? We just went down a whole road. We just talked about laws in America. We just went down this whole thing of talking about, hey, open your eyes up. See the issues in life. Try to help people. Do all that you can. Make sure that, 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 that you're a good steward of these things so you can help. and all. Don't be lazy. And we went down that whole road, right? But what was the initial question? Look at it. A lawyer stood up and put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to have eternal life? <laughs> Isn't that something? How, what must I do to get it? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus goes through this teaching to find out what kind of heart this man really has. Is it in you to help someone that's not like you? Is it in you to pour love into a situation and pour care and and compassion and time and possible money? Is it in you to do that? Because if it's not in you to do that, then you don't have love thy neighbor in your heart. And if you don't have love thy neighbor in your heart, it's because you do not have love thy God in your heart. And he brings them all the way back to the very original commandment of the word of God. Love the Lord your God with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know what 1 John 4, verse 8 says? You love not because you do not know God. And God is love. You do not love or you loveth not because you do not know God. And if you knew God, you'd be loving this neighbor. If you knew God, you'd be pouring into this person. If you knew God, you'd get the story. If you knew God, you'd understand. Jesus takes him on this journey, and he doesn't get it. It's so powerful that Jesus takes the very most complicated stories sometimes or issues, and he explains them in such a clear way to have it turn right back on you. And the next thing you know, you're looking in a mirror, and you start realizing, oh, I am not neighborly. And then the question, next question is, oh no, I'm not godly, or am I godly, or do I know God? That's the next question. I'll tell you, yesterday's events with an assassination attempt on the former president, it, it, it's really struck me to the heart. Because there's such hatred For people, whether you want to call it politically motivated or mentally ill or whatever you want to call it, whatever, there is such evil language that's being shot at everybody that people would rather people die than to lose an election. People would rather take people out than to not get their way. We live in crazy times. Jews felt kind of a similar way about the Samaritans. They hated them. Samaritans hated the Jews. And here you have people at each other's throats. And God is cutting through all of it and he's saying, you have not love thy neighbor because you have not loved thy God. You don't have that in your system. But if you did, oh, You'd have a different outlook, and you'd have a different heart, and you'd be a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You'd be an evangelist. The Southern Baptist churches in America are in a a tough spot. A lot of people, a lot of people have pulled out of the churches. A lot of people have stopped going to church. A lot of people have stopped evangelizing. A lot of people are stopping to love thy neighbor. And why are they stopping to love thy neighbor in their communities? I'll tell you why, friends. They're stopping it because they don't love thy God. That's it. So I want to ask this question. Do you love your neighbor? Do you love your neighbor? And if you don't, well, then there might be, you might be in danger of something even bigger. Maybe you don't love your God. Maybe you don't love the creator of the universe. Maybe you don't love the one who gave his son to die on the cross for you, who loved you in spite of your sin, loved you 
knowing your sin, loved you knowing your heart for sin, and gave you eternal life. Friends, if there's anyone here that doesn't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, let today be the day of salvation for you. Let today be the day that you love thy God. Let today be the day that you get the right answer for this great question that's involved in all of this. Well, you'd love not your neighbor because you don't really have a relationship with God. But when you have a relationship with God, you know what flows out of that? Loving others. So good. My heart is today is that we would have a true understanding of not only what it means to love others, but especially that we know what it means to love God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word today. Today is a little bit more of a serious message. It's a, it's a message that kind of digs deep into our heart and our life. It makes us kind of stand before the mirror and see, are we doing it right? Are we, are we who are we, and, and, and what kind of life do we have? Do we have a relationship with the Lord God Almighty, or do we not? Are we a child of the King of Kings and have received love, so therefore we love, or are we not loving because we really haven't received it? Oh, Father, I pray today for a conviction upon all of us that we would make sure that we love and care for those around us. That we would be people of charity. People who recognize the needs in our community. Recognize the needs of our neighbors, our family. But Lord, all of that is contingent on the fact that we know you and how much you love us. So I want to pray for us, as, as many Christians here today, that we would be people who are charitable and helping others. But I pray also, Lord, that there may be somebody here listening to my voice who don't have a personal relationship with the God of all creation, the God who first loved us. The Bible says God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. The greatest act of love is that one lays down his life for another, and Jesus did that for each of us. And so, maybe there's somebody here that needs to surrender their life to Christ. I pray, Lord God, that you'd save their soul today. They'd realize that they're a sinner in need of a Savior. They would come and confess that and profess that to one of the ministers here and make sure that they know that they are saved Make sure that they realize that they can receive the gift of eternal life if they trust in you for eternal life. So, Lord, I pray these things knowing that you can work in a huge way. So during this invitation, I pray that you would work calling people to yourself, calling people to respond. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.